Welcome to another episode of the MMA Lockcast. I'm your host, Manpreet, a.k.a. MMA Lock of the Night, your boy on social media at MMALOTN, and the architect behind the MMA Fight Archive, ensuring you leave no stone unturned when you're researching these upcoming MMA events. How do I know so much about the fighters I'm about to break down for you guys on this podcast? It is all thanks to the Fight Archive as it allowed me to have a very efficient studying session to get through this card, having direct links to past fights for all of these upcoming fights uh, and opponents and, and competitors. It's all on the MMA Fight Archive over 3,400 fighter profiles for you to look through, not to mention we cover over 17 promotions from all over the world. Make sure you check it out for free with a seven-day free trial MMA Fight Archive link in the description below. All right. This is the second Lockcast episode of the week as we have PFL kicking off their 2024 regular season this Thursday, or I should say tomorrow, uh, aka today if you're watching this because I am recording this closer to 11 p.m. the day before the fight. Finally got through all the studying with all the other work that I had on top of it with the archive updates and the UFC studying, not to mention we got three more cards, uh, regional cards to break down uh, that will strictly be going down on the Lock of the Night Patreon page, so if you want access to those LFA, Cage Warriors, and KSW breakdowns. I have you covered over there. But the PFL, Bellator, and UFC, as well as Contender Series, will always be broken down in full on the YouTube page here. So I appreciate all the love and support you guys give your boy. Just make sure you guys drop a like, drop a subscribe, uh, drop a comment as well. That is more than enough help. If you want to go the extra mile, check out the Lock of the Night Patreon page. That is, that is the best way to support your boy. So I can continue to bring you quality breakdowns on a weekly basis basis all right we got the pfl regular season kicking off this week uh, i believe it's heavyweights and women's flyweights that are on tap first um and i believe next week uh we have light heavyweights and they're doing it on the thursday or friday uh in the lead up to ufc 300 so a uh, solid offering over there but in terms of this week we got a lot of fun matchups and the big thing that's uh going to be very apparent here is the whole pfl and bellator merger now this is a pfl card but you're going to see plenty of bellator fighters on it as well which just adds more intrigue to the season and seeing that some of these guys that have consistently made it into the playoffs or made it to the finals how they will do against for competition being inserted into the bracket and into the season roster so very much looking forward to that so uh with this pfl breakdown it won't be you know super in depth like my ufc cards were are, usually are i like to be a little bit more brief a little bit more straight to the point and i'll try to spend you know a decent amount of time on each matchup but get to the point asap so we can get through this podcast nice and efficiently so we got 12 fights to talk about Let's not waste any time. Let's get into the first one here where we got Bryce Meredith coming in at minus 1,800 going up against Ty Johnson who comes in at plus 900. I believe this is more so just a showcase belt rather than an actual regular season belt of which there are, I believe, two on this card. Um, and Meredith, obviously one of the brighter brighter prospects that Bellator was building up uh, before they ended up closing up shop. But he put together a 5-0 and undefeated record coming from a highly touted collegiate wrestling back background and you can see that on full display when he looks to take his opponents to the ground and smash them from that top position he finished his first four opponents but his fifth opponent was a little bit more durable and tougher to put away but it was ensuring to see uh, Meredith go the full 15 minutes while smashing his opponent and still able to keep up the level of uh, effectiveness and activity over those 15 minutes to still get his hand raised on the scorecards. His opponent this weekend, Ty Johnson, comes in on a seven-fight winning streak and is a BJJ black belt under uh, Lucas Brennan's father, uh, Lucas obviously fighting in the matchup after this uh, so you can expect obviously a very aggressive BJJ game from him, from him and that's what we normally see when you see him throw down uh, his striking game leaves a lot to be desired uh, his takedowns not the greatest but has been able to get him this winning streak that he has but let's be honest the winning streak that he's been on as of late not the highest level of competition his most impressive one was against Askar Askarov's or sorry Askar Askar's brother if you guys remember Askar Askar um, from uh, well he was supposed to make it to the UFC had a lot of issues uh, LFA fighter as well but either way 
Ty Johnson has a solid first round, drops the second round, but in the third round, manages to get the takedown and control that fight to win it on the scorecards. Uh, Meredith should be able to smash him from that top position. There will be sticky situations where Johnson might be able to throw up some submission attempts or even get some reversals, but I believe in Meredith's uh, training camp training over there at the MMA lab and his ability to scramble and get out of bad spots while still damaging Johnson from that top spot. But regardless, minus 1600 is not anything you ever want to lay on. What I might be looking at and has a little bit of my intrigue is the decision line here at plus 325 for Meredith. I am expecting some fight from Johnson here and causing this fight to go into deep waters. It could potentially go the full 15 minutes and Meredith at plus 325 rather than minus 1800 probably the better way to go in this spot so give me meredith and meredith by decision next up we got another minus 1800 favorite as we got lucas brennan taking on dimitri ivy who comes in at plus 900 now lucas brennan has a spotless record and i had a little bit more confidence than i should have had in him in his last matchup against weber almeida and luckily for him he landed a perfectly placed and timed knee near the ending of his third round against almeida and was able to get the knockout there because it was not looking good for him for the first two and a half rounds he was unable to secure his takedowns and almeida was doing a great job in terms of battering him on the feet and hurting him very badly but it was very encouraging to see Brennan be able to fight back from adversity and still end up getting his hand raised normally Brennan looks to utilize his wrestling background to get fights to the ground and utilize his high level BJJ game where he's able to usually lock up chokes and submissions to get his opponents out of there his opponent this weekend Dimitri Ivy is a regional journeyman and also the brother of former UFC fighter Anthony Ivy and I just don't really see what he he's the best at he's a bjj black belt but nothing that really jumps off the page that makes me believe he's going to be able to give lucas brennan some issues here he's a decent striker decent all-around fighter you know what decent's being generous just below average fighter all around uh has never really been able to put together much of a solid winning streak uh, i think since 2017 the only long the longest winning streak he's been able to put together is two fights uh, he's coming off of a recent victory over a six and five opponent who he was able to submit in the first round and before that he got knocked out by a fighter that's not really a big knockout artist in carlton minus uh, I get the experience advantage that Ivy might have in this matchup, but I think he's going to be in for a bit of a, a nightmare against Brennan, who should be able to eventually find a submission and get him out of there within two rounds. So give me Brennan again. Minus 1800 is not a spot that I want to put too much uh, money on um, or even at all, you know what I mean, given the lack of return you'll be getting there. And even his submission prop is sitting at minus 220, which is way too chalky for a specific exact uh, method of victory prop. And that's why I'm going to pass on this match up but i do think brendan goes in there and does work all right now we got some somewhat competitive matchups that we can finally talk about the first of which chelsea hackett coming in at plus 215 she takes on jenna bishop very fun fight here as we have chelsea hackett who returned from roughly a three and a half year long layoff last time around and she showcased a completely different game she came into the contender series back in 2020 as a highly touted prospect coming from a striking background but she got outworked outgrinded and finished by victoria leonardo who is you know low level to say the best but Hackett took a bunch of time away started training at a gym called House of Jiu-Jitsu and you can see that she wanted to show that off in her last matchup as she went right to the grappling against a grapple heavy opponent and then eventually found that rear naked choke in the second round to get the tap uh, Hackett like I said, normally looks to go out there and strike, but you have to wonder how much confidence and skill she's been able to obtain, especially going from being a 21-year-old in 2020 to a 24-year-old now, uh, who you know is likely a much better product than what we saw in the Contender Series. The question becomes, what, has, what does her grappling defense look like against higher levels of opponent? And we'll find that answer out this weekend as she takes on Jenna Bishop, who I wish got involved in MMA a little bit earlier. Even though she, is, she has a spot this 6-0 record. She's a third degree BJJ black belt who spent the majority of her career relying and just competing in the BJJ realm and then she turned pro uh, for mixed martial arts back in 2021 and has been able to pick up some big victories in that meantime. When she's able to get opponents to the ground with her wrestling or her judo, she's very difficult to deal with as she has great control from the top position but as we saw in her last matchup against Larry Joanne, she was able to lock up an arm bar victory and get that tap in the first round. Now in this matchup specifically, we just don't know what to expect with Hackett's defensive grappling. Is she going to have 
improved takedown defense? Because if she does, she might end up being the one that looks like a minus 250 favorite in this spot as Bishop will be forced to strike in this spot. However, if Bishop is able to get this fight to the ground, I think that will see a tremendous advantage in her favor, which will obviously make her look like the minus 250 that she's coming in with. So there's a lot of question marks on the Chelsea Hackett side that I don't really want to invest on this fight to find out whether she has improved her defensive grappling enough. We know her offensive grappling is very solid, but it's definitely not going to be better than what Jenna Bishop brings to the table. So I'm going to still lean with Bishop here, and I think she grinds this fight out, um, you know, gives Hackett a little bit more of a lesson. Not anything that Hackett should be taking too harshly on herself, as this is a very high-level jiu-jitsu black belt that she's going up against. But I think that will see Bishop grind this fight out and win it on the scorecards. All right, next up, we got Kana Watanabe coming in at minus 265. She's going up against former UFC fighter Shanna Young, who comes in at plus 225. We'll start off on the Kana Watanabe side, who is 2-2 two and two over her last four fights. And last time around, she was able to defeat Vita Artiega in July by grinding her out and winning the fight on the scorecard. It was a very close fight. I believe it was the first two rounds uh, or the, the first and third round. Uh, I, I could be off. Sorry, I'm uh, blanking at this moment. Sorry, it was the second, sorry, first and th- second round that should be seen in Watanabe's favor uh, as she was able to really put the grind on Vita, uh, pushing her up against the cage, not really being able to secure much of a ground position and be able to do big damage from there as she's used to doing. Uh, but she showed off her zombie-like approach where she just stays in her opponent's face, doesn't show the greatest striking. You know, she throws kicks from distance, but her hands are very sloppy. She leaves a lot of openings, which is why Liz Carmouche was able to starch her the way that she did in the beginning of their fight. But when Watanabe is in her group, she's very difficult to deal with when she's able to get fights to the ground and dominate from that top position her opponent this weekend shanna young went one and three in the ufc although she had some very tough opponents and some short notice circumstances surrounding some of them uh but we did see what she looks like at her best when she went up against gina mazani and finished her in the second round we also saw her put on a solid performance against sandra lovato in her last matchup where she grinded out lovato with her grapple heavy approach but also landed some very good shots in the strong striking realm young has a clean and crisp striking game especially with the right hand she throws down the pipe with such uh power and speed and that could ultimately be some of the the success she could have in this matchup against watanabe i think young has the strength to compete with watanabe in the clinch but i think watanabe's technical wrestling and grappling may end up allow her to allowing her to get this fight to the ground but if we can continue to see enough fight from young here to keep this fight upright she might be able to have the advantage in the striking realm and land some big shots on Watanabe to swing the judges in her favor. Watanabe is getting up there in age. She might be starting to slow down. And given the strength, possible strength, and definite striking advantage that Young has, I think she's a live underdog to go out there and pull off the upset in this spot. I've been big on Watanabe in the past, but it seems like her performances are getting less and less dominant. And I believe that Young is a fighter that is able to expose those holes in Watanabe's game, specifically in the striking room. So I don't mind the shot at plus 225. I was actually able to get plus 260 uh, on a different book here, but. I just like to keep things consistent in terms of the book that I use for all the odds that I'm um, uh, referring to in this podcast. Uh, But even her knockout prop at plus 1600 is worth a little bit of a poke considering the advantage that she has in that matchup and how horrible the striking defense is from Kana Watanabe. So give me Shanna Young. Shanna Young by TKO. Uh, Line is just too far too wide here considering the openings that Watanabe leaves that Young should be able to take advantage of. All right, moving on to the heavyweights, we got Steve Mowry coming in at plus 130, taking on Oleg Popov, who comes in at minus 150. Now, both these guys are coming over, I believe, from the Bellator uh, scene, so it's nice to see them actually being matched up here. Uh, Mowry, very tall and towering heavyweight, who's had a very solid success through his first 10 fights. However, he is starting to run into some trouble over his last couple, where he ended up coming up short against Valentin Moldovsky, getting completely grinded out in that matchup, and then went to a draw against Ali Isayev in a fight where he was able to take up, uh, take advantage of a minor slip-up in the second round from Isayev, land in the top position, and Isayev was unable to work back to his feet. Um, we got a 10-8 from Steve Murray in that second round, but he was unable to deal with the grappling in the first and third rounds, which ultimately ended up getting that fight to be a draw. But if he goes up against guys that are grapple heavy and have good enough technical skills in terms of keeping him on his back, 
that's where he normally ends up coming up short. He's strong, he's powerful, he's big, but he's kind of slow, he's tall, he's lumbering, and that will end up butting him in the ass against higher levels of competition. He's very strong like when he's able to get that top position, which is why he's been able to secure so many Kimura victories because he's able to just reach over his opponent from that half guard position and secure that Kimura and then put in a position that opponents are unable to get it back uh, into a safe spot. But um, I think at best in his in the clinch, he throws nasty knees with a lot of power and really drains his opponents with it. But I still have some question marks about how far he can take it, uh, especially as he continues to garner higher levels of ex- of experience. His opponent this weekend, Oleg Popov, went through uh, a solid 15 minutes against Golkan Sirikam, uh, but he struggled to really maintain a lot of dominant position in that matchup. Luckily for him, he was able to land some uh, mat returns and good clinch control up against the cage to really muzzle Sarakam. Uh, but Sarakam, I think it's Sarah Cham actually. Mr. Cham had uh, big difficulties in terms of getting off on any of his own uh, offense, which ultimately allowed Popov to get his hand raised on the scorecards. I still have some question marks about the level of competition that Popov can do this type of style against and be successful with. Um, but I think that this is a matchup against Maori. He should be able to get away with it. I don't have a whole load of confidence i think the over one and a half might be the better spot to go with as Mari might be able to pull off something eventually later on in this matchup as popov starts to slow down and maybe struggles to try to get Mari into those bad spots and that could allow you know Mari to like i said maybe lock onto a submission or land a big shot and really hurt popov in this uh fight so I- i'm not too hot on the minus 150 on popov um but i do think he ends up grinding this fight out winning it on the scorecard but the over one and a half is the only thing that really has my eye here all right moving back to the women's flyweights we got tyla santos making her pfl debut coming in as a minus 950 favorite she goes up against alara joanne who comes in at plus 650 now i know a lot of people were surprised including myself when we saw tyla santos was released from the ufc after she's been on a two-fight losing streak the first of which was a title fight against valentina shevchenko as we saw shevchenko pushed more to than any fight she's been in up to that point, obviously, the Alexa Grosso fights were after that. Uh, but Santos had some very solid success with her grappling and controlling uh, Shevchenko in these certain spots. But it was her cardio that started to fail her later on in this matchup, allowing Shevchenko to win the later rounds to get her hand raised on the scorecards. And that, once again, came to bite her in the ass again for Santos in her next matchup against Aaron Blanchfield, as she had a very solid first round, stopping the takedowns of Blanchfield and battering her with some straight shots down the pipe. But she was unable to deal with the pace and pressure that Blanchfield was putting on her in the second and third rounds which ultimately allowed Blanchfield to win that fight on the scorecards as well here though uh you know Santos she should have a solid advantage over most opponents that she faces in the flyweight division of PFL but you have to wonder what it's going to look like when she does face some resistance and if her cardio woes will come back to haunt her she's strong when she gets in the clinch and she's difficult to deal with when she's able to secure that top position and she has some solid striking as well where she's been able to target the legs of her opponents and really land some big shots down the pipe her opponent this weekend Ilari Joanne is a pit bull of a fighter and I don't just mean that with her style but she also trains out of the pitbull brothers camp where she often shows a very aggressive style uh, a bull type of style where she just bull rushes her opponents with big power strikes if she feels she has an advantage in the grappling room she'll look to drag them to the ground but she just does not do the greatest work in terms of looking for openings to advance positions she just tries to stay busy enough from that top position from full guard and just control her opponent en route to decision victories but we're seeing now that she's on a bit of a slump that she will come up against technically better fighters i was surprised that key holtz was unable to get the win that night but we saw bruna ellen outstrike her over 15 minutes and then we we saw Jenna Bishop secure the submission and make her tap out. Now, I think Santos will have a tremendous grappling and jujitsu advantage in this matchup, which could allow her to go out there and pull off a submission here. Minus 950 is prohibitive in my opinion, but the juice may be where Santos uh, by submission is. And that currently sits around plus two Tony on certain spots. And I think that we can see Santos get this fight to the ground, put Joanne into uncomfortable positions and eventually uh, find a submission and secure either a tap or an arm bar whatever it might be but i think that we'll see her get the uh get the choke uh tap whatever it might be but it will be a submission and i expect the majority of santos's success to come in the grappling realm here so look for santos to uh, out grapple joanny and find the submission
Moving over to the heavyweight division, we got Blagoy Ivanov coming in at plus 140, another former UFC fighter, going up against Sergei Bilostiny, who comes in at minus 160. Now, Ivanov, through eight UFC fights, put together a 3-5 and five record, but all eight of those fights ended up going to a scorecard, which is crazy considering that he fights at the heavyweight division. But I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that this guy has the best chin that we may have ever seen in the UFC. Eating the bombs that he ate from guys like Derek Lewis was a very uh, crazy sight to see. He didn't even flinch in any of those spots. But sometimes what makes him uh, kind of get behind his his opponent is the fact that he's a little bit too patient with the striking approach he has a credited uh, sambo background as well but he doesn't seem to employ that often in his fights he normally likes to slug it out with his opponents throwing in combinations working the body going up back to the head but he doesn't throw with such heat that it you know opponents that can put together better volume like we saw with uh alexander romanov in his last ufc matchup could cause uh blagoy even off some issues here now his opponent bill Steiny picked up his first Bellator victory last time around as he landed a beautiful spinning back kick against Kareem Aras, I believe the kid's name was, uh, and then he followed up with some punches and got him out of there quickly. Uh, his previous matchup, he lost via DQ to Tyrell Fortune in a fight where he can continuously landed uh, shots to the back of the head, which caused uh, Fortune issues caused the fight to be stopped and he was rightfully disqualified that night Bilustani is normally a striker that likes to go out there and utilize some spinning stuff but he normally gets his opponents out of there quickly which leads me to wonder if he can go a hard 15 minutes if he needs to as he continues to continues to take steps up in competition his flaw from what i've been seeing in past fights is his lack of takedown defense and an ability to work back to his feet but luckily for him he's going up against a guy in Ivanov who doesn't often show a grapple heavy approach or urgency in his matchups if this stays as a competitive striking matchup i still lean bill Steiny as i believe his speed and output advantage will put him ahead even off uh, on the scorecards in this matchup but it's tough to play minus 160 on a guy that's taking the, you know a, a big step up in competition and facing a guy that has as much experience as as Blagoy. Um and you don't know if Blagoy is actually going to lean on his wrestling this time around tape and history tells us he probably won't but maybe he knows that hey if I win this PFL tournament I get a million dollars maybe that's enough encouragement for him to go out there and actually fight with some solid fight IQ but that's still not enough for me to go on and go out there and back Blagoy in this spot I think we'll see this fight go 15 minutes just as most of Blagoy's fights have been going as of late uh, and I think we'll see Bill Ostani land the more damaging blows over 15 minutes winning this fight on the scorecards but the over two and a half is the spot that I like the most out of all of them all right, moving on to another heavyweight matchup is actually a rematch between Marcelo Gome, who comes in at minus 150. He's going up against Daniel James, who comes in at plus 130. Now, these guys threw down last year in a main event slot for Bellator, and it was Marcelo Gome that did a very good job through the first two rounds. Unfortunately for him, he ended up eating a big shot from Daniel James in the opening minute of round three that caused the fight to be stopped. Now, Gome showcased a solid combinations of calf kicks and grinding grappling, and that's where James normally finds a lot of his issues. We saw uh, Gokan Sercham actually utilize the same blueprint, but he was successful with it over 15 minutes, grinding out Daniel James, utilizing the calf kick, and then eventually uh, shooting open cage takedowns to get James to the ground. And from there, James has almost no answers in terms of working back to his feet. I think we'll see Gome. Uh, showcase a little bit better fight IQ this time around, especially knowing he only has to go 15 minutes compared to the 30 or 25 minutes that they were scheduled for the first time they were going to throw down. This is one of those spots where, you know, James maybe catches him once, twice, three times out of 10 times that they fight. So let, let's hope that this is one of those seven, eight or nine times that Marcelo Gomes' more complete style ends up getting him the victory in this matchup. I think that we'll see Gomes uh, utilize the calf kick a little bit more as that really seemed to hinder the movement and power of James throughout his fights and I think from there he'll eventually be able to set up some well-timed takedowns and then just smash James from that top position and grind him out over 15 minutes winning this fight on the scorecards so again this is one of those fights where it might not go the same way as the first ma matchup ended up going which is why I believe that Gome is the favorite in this matchup once again and he should be able to assert a better style and effectiveness this time around and win this fight on the scorecards all right 
Kicking off the main card, we have the biggest favorite on the card as Dakota Decheva coming in and coming in at minus 2,800. She's going up against Lisa Malden, who comes in at plus 1,300. Decheva won the PFL Europe tournament this past year, and that marked her ability to come to the PFL main roster and try to fight some higher level competition and possibly secure a million dollar paycheck if she's able to get her hand raised throughout the season and playoffs. She comes from a kickboxing background, but you see the uh, well-roundedness in her grappling game coming to fruition especially with the amount of time she's been spending down there at American Top Team. She's been putting her combinations together well and blending in takedowns behind it and doing a great job in terms of putting her opponents away and making it look easy. She's fought the best that Europe has had to offer in these divisions which is a solid look for her but now that she's going to be fighting some true competition maybe not this weekend but down the road we'll really see how uh, how far she can take this potential and how good she actually is. Her opponent this weekend Lisa Malden uh, has pulled off back-to-back upset victories over Helen Peralta and Desiree Yanez in matchups where a lot of people expected um, uh, Malden to get outgrinded and outgrappled in those matchups, but she was the one that ended up outgrinding and outgrappling her opponents, finishing Desiree Yanez by submission and then grind, uh, and then getting the third round TKO over Helen Peralta. Uh, Malden is you know, a, a decent fighter. She's strong. She prefers the grappling realm, it seems, but she's lost to some very low level competition, which makes you wonder maybe now she's actually in her prime and actually the most comfortable she's ever been in the cage. However, she should still be at a big technical disadvantage here against Decheva, who should be able to piece her up on the feet. Um, and I think that this matchup actually gets into the second round where we'll eventually see Malden start to slow down, start to really wear the damage that Decheva is shelling out. And I think that we'll see Decheva probably finish her in the second or third round. Again, minus 2,800 is not a line that you want to play at all. Even in parlays, it just does not do enough for it. And especially in a sport like MMA, where a banana peel moment can happen at any time it's not worth it it is not worth it at all but i think that decheva wins this fight and i think she finishes malden in the second or third round all right another rematch that we have on the card here one that was very surprising we got liz carmouche coming in at minus 170 going up against juliana velasquez who comes in at plus 145 now this is the third time these two women are going to be facing each other after carmouche already has two victories over velasquez the first came when she had a premature stoppage by TKO in the fourth round, which uh, dethroned Juliana Velasquez as the flyweight queen in Bellator. And then they had an re- immediate rematch where Liz Carmouche eventually found a second round submission by armbar and was successfully able to defend her title that night. She did have another fight or two more fights after that against Deanna Bennett in a fight where she you know, didn't look the greatest for her until she clamped onto a submission in the fourth round and was able to get the tap. Um, but she was getting out grinded and now grappled by Deanna Bennett, who seemed very dead set on putting a grappling showcase that night. But Carmouche pulled it out, showing her championship medal and showcasing why she is uh, she has been as successful as she has been since leaving the UFC. Uh, she followed that up by defeating her opponent um, or, or her friend and training partner, Ali Malay McFarlane, as she hacked away at her legs and eventually got a TKO in the fifth round by leg kicks. She's pretty much been undefeated since being released from the UFC in 2019. And she's gone out there and uh, defended her title three times, won the flyweight title, all of that stuff. So it's very weird that she's actually in the regular season for the PFL here, considering she's a champion. And she has no idea if she's still a champion or not. Um, and she was even more surprised that they ended up giving her Juliana Velasquez again. Velasquez, her last two fights were against Carmouche, and she hasn't seen any action in nearly a year and a half sitting on the sidelines the entire time. Now, normally rematches don't end up going the same as the original fights, or in this case, the first two fights, but I find it hard to believe that Velasquez will be able to deal with the wrestling advantage that Carmouche has in this matchup. Carmouche had done such a great job in their first two fights in terms of uh, with her takedown entries and then turning the corner and really making uh, Velasquez have to work to stay on her feet. But then once Carmouche 
Mamouche was able to get her to the ground. She did a great job in terms of keeping her there, bullying her up against the cage, and then finding those finishing opportunities that she was able to secure in the first and second fight, like I said. Uh, Velasquez is a decent striker, but when she's at her best, she's able to implement a grapple-heavy approach. But it seems like the advantage that Carmouche has in the straight-up wrestling style is ultimately going to be the issue here for uh, Velasquez. So Aline Carmouche... Uh, she's minus 170, a little bit chalky for me, especially for a fighter that's now 40 years old. And again, I never, I haven't really had the best um, record in terms of betting fights that are rematches. I always end up on the wrong side. So I don't want to have too much confidence on Carmouche here if Velasquez has been able to make some improvements during her time off. But I think based off everything that we've seen on tape, Carmouche should be able to dominate in the grappling realm once again. And she only needs three rounds this time to do it. And I think she should win at least two of those rounds en route to a decision victory. All right. Moving over to the heavyweight co-main event here, we have, uh, I believe, yeah, finalist, runner-up for the 2023 heavyweight division, Dennis Goldsov coming in at minus 140, going up against Linton Vassell, who comes in at plus 120. Now, Dennis Goldsov had a very solid run uh, in 2023, which ultimately got derailed by Henan Ferreira, who was able to knock him out in the second round of their matchup. We saw Goldsov get him to the ground and grind him out easily in that first round, but then it was that danger zone in the second round where he was unable to get away from the big power that Ferreira brought to the table and eventually got knocked out. There's been small moments that Goldsov has struggled in, which ultimately got him on the losing end. We saw in the Ferreira, Ferreira fight, we saw in the Ali Isaiah fight, and we even saw in the uh, Ante Delia fight where he was unable to really pull away late in that fight or, or those fights, which ultimately got him his losses that he has. But he is probably the best fighter on the PFL roster that has yet to win the million dollar check. Will this be the year? I don't know. He's going up against a very tough Linton Vassell, who was originally scheduled to fight Ryan Bader for the heavyweight title at UFC or Bellator 300. Um, I believe it was Bader who ended up getting hurt or Vassell who ended up getting hurt. But regardless, Vassell gets stripped of that opportunity to fight for the title and now finds himself in PFL looking to secure a million dollar paycheck. Vassell is absolutely a massive heavyweight. And it's crazy that he used to make 205 pounds, but I'm glad that he settled in at this heavyweight weight class because this seems to be the one that is probably the best for him he's usually very good in terms of clamping his opponents on the mat and doing good good work from that top position but he's also powerful and explosive with the big power that he brings with his strikes considering the speed and explosiveness and that's usually able to go out there and uh, allow him to knock his opponents out just as he did last time around against former title challenger Valentin Moldovsky I think that this is another matchup where Vassell can stay competitive in the grappling realm but as long as this fight stays in the striking realm gold up will be in some big trouble and Vassell could potentially put him away in this spot this is also a fight where I think it will go into deep waters and the history has normally shown us that Goldsov does not really have that extra gear to be safe enough in these later rounds against higher levels of competition and I think he could falter here against Vassell but I, I could also see the outcome which I will ultimately predict that Vassell knocks him out within the first two rounds as he stays competitive in the striking realm forces Goldsov to strike and then eventually finds that big punch to put him out cold so I do like Vassell here and I expect him to start his PFL career off with a bang with a knockout all right main event I believe or well actually uh the uh, anti Delia. The 2022 heavyweight champion uh, coming in at plus 120. He's going up against Valentin Moldovsky, who comes in at minus 140. We'll start off on the Delia side, who is riding a, I believe, six-fight winning streak. Sorry, five-fight winning streak. Uh, won the 2022 season uh 2023 was only one fight for him as he fought maurice green in the second regular season belt the first regular season belt he was forced to pull out due to a minor injury that he suffered and that ultimately caused him to not make the playoffs considering he won by decision against uh, maurice green uh, and that was not enough for him to make it to the playoffs considering the lack of points that he was able to put together in only one fight but normally delia likes to utilize a grapple heavy approach putting his opponents to the ringer dragging them to the ground and doing some good work from uh, on top but he's also shown some solid confidence in his striking game which has allowed him to go out there and knock out guys like Matthias Scheffel and even land that knockdown against Maurice Green in the second round of their fight I think Delia has really um 
gained a lot of confidence in himself, especially especially after winning the heavyweight division uh, back in 2022. And I think that's going to continue to will him to some more victories uh, in 2024. But he's going up against a very tough Valentin Moldovsky who came up short in his content, or sorry, a, a title shot against Ryan Bader uh, a couple fights back. Uh, that was a fight that came down to the fifth round and it just seemed like Bader had a little bit more left in the gas tank to give and that ultimately caused Vol- Moldovsky to lose that fight on the scorecards. Moldovsky eventually followed that up by getting knocked out by the co-main eventer, Linton Vassell, who was able to land a big shot and put Moldovsky's lights out. I think that we'll see uh, uh, Moldovsky look to utilize his grapple-heavy approach as usual, try to get in on the hips of Dalia, but uh, I haven't been the most impressed with Moldovsky's ability to control his opponents. And I think we know that Dalia is a guy that doesn't often settle for bad spots, and I think he will be able to put together a good enough game plan to thwart Moldovsky. And another thing, earlier today during the ceremonial weigh-ins, it was alarming to see the size difference in favor of Dalia in this spot, which makes me believe that he should be able to have some more success in the grappling realm, even if it is from a defensive perspective. I expect him to really dictate where this fight is able to take place. He may not be able to control Moldovsky on the ground, but he should be able to put him up against the cage, land some good shots, look like the more active fighter, and land good enough shots that if this fight does end up going to the scorecards, he could end up getting his hand raised. But I'm ultimately going to call Dalia by knockout here. I think he should be able to keep this fight upright, and I think that he might be at a slight speed disadvantage, but that won't be able to keep Moldovsky away from the big power that's going to be coming his way. Give me Dalia, give me Dalia by knockout, and I think at plus 120, he's a must play in this spot. There you guys go. Full card breakdown for PFL 1, the opening event for their 2024 regular season. They obviously got two more events coming up in back-to-back weeks, so make sure you guys look out for those breakdowns next week. Otherwise, make sure you guys check out all the great UFC content I've already dropped. A ton of content dropping this week. Not to mention we got three regional events to break down for you guys on the Lock of the Night Patreon page. So if you're looking for that, check the link in the description below. Otherwise, I will see you guys tomorrow for the quick picks for UFC Vegas 90. See you then. Peace.